Dear listeners, welcome to another episode in the podcast series, The Way Out is In. Today, we're going to be talking about inner healing. We all have suffering. We all have traumas. We all have issues from our childhood that need resolving. And today we're going to talk about how to face into our challenges and suffering and find a way through. The way out is in. My name is Joe Confino. And I am Brother Fap Hu, a Zen Buddhist monk in the tradition of Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh. And we're actually in his hut in uh, southwest France in Plum Village, which is the monastery of uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. Yes, and the hut's name is Sitting Still Hut. And today we are very happy to have a special guest with us, Sister Sinim, and her names translate into Adornment with Liveliness. Mm. And, and she lives up to that name. She does. She, yeah, she, she really does. She brings a lot of joy to the community. And uh, if you have been joining our online retreat throughout the pandemic, you have definitely seen her on screen as MC, as well as offering Dhamma sharings and other activities online. And it's very special to have her today because uh, she will be moving to our center in Australia. The center is called Entering the Streams Monastery. And it is in Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne. Mm-hmm. And Sister Sinim was originally from uh, Australia. So it's like returning back to her roots in a way. So I definitely wanted to catch her and have her as a guest before she leaves to Australia. So Sister Sinim, would you please uh, introduce yourself a little bit and just share a little bit with our listener who you are and why did you become a nun? What was your journey? Yes, thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a real pleasure and honor to be in a podcast. It's I've never been on a podcast before. <laughs> so this is the very first time. Um, yeah, and we're very... Uh, we used to have like radio stations, but this is like in some ways a bit like that. Um, so um, I'm Sister Sin Ngim and um, I was born in Vietnam, but I, uh, I went to Australia when I was uh, eight and I grew up in Australia, studied there, and had a bit of a career in Australia before I ordained at uh, 32 years. That's re- relatively late um, <laughs> compared to um, many of our brothers and sisters here who ordained in their late teens or early 20s. So I was a bit of a late bloomer, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> and sister, what was uh, what was your the reason you became a nun? So what was uh, the spark for your monastic life? Um, yeah, I don't know where to start because um, there have been many conditions that um, led led me to become a monastic. I wasn't um, as a teenager. Uh, I remember attending um, my grandfather's funeral at a local temple in Australia. And we just, you know, like um, we uh, chanted and in the Vietnamese traditional style. And I remember I attended all the ceremony and I kept falling asleep in all of them because I don't understand any of it, the chanting because it was all in Sino-Vietnamese. But I think that something's got in, but um, I met uh, the, my first teacher, my first Buddhist teacher was uh, a monk, an English monk called Abhinyana. And he was a, he ordained in the Theravadan tradition, but he often went to the refugee camps in Indonesia and Malaysia to teach the Dharma to the refugee people. And he was very much in contact with the Vietnamese community there. And I remember about around 16, my, my parents took me to listen to these Dharma talks from this English monk and and uh, he always encouraged me to ask questions and because i always had a lot of questions to ask him and uh, i think that was my first contact with the dharma around 16 but i remember as um 
as a child, maybe around five years old or something. I remember in Vietnam, we, I remember watching a movie and I saw um, the image of a, a Catholic nun, you know, with the, the black and white habit. And I thought, oh, that's, I like that. I want to be, you know, I want to wear that. So that was my first, something much deeper than my memory could go, but I wanted to become an, a nun, some sort of a uh, religious person, even as a very young pers- uh, young child. And then at 16, and then when I came in contact with the Dharma, and um, I followed this teacher for a while, and and I he, he gave me the name Stone, because actually my nickname is Da, and put a yosak on, like the accent, and becomes Da or Stone. But he wouldn't take any... Um, disciples but I, in some ways I felt like he I was his disciple in some ways and um, his, he, he gave me a name and then um, he became very sick with uh, throat cancer and when he became sick that was when I went to Plum Village for the first time to check out monastic life and then um, when he died before he died I asked him oh what do you think if I ordain it was like he was passing me on. I had found somebody to continue my my spiritual journey, and um, yeah, I felt like he had. We had some sort of a teacher student relationship, and then I found Tay and I ordained after that. Great, thank you, sister. So um, today we were going to talk about healing our childhood wounds and um and one of the things i've always been very impressed with tiknatan is the fact that he has integrated um the very depths of buddhist teachings with also some western psychology and um and he does a lot of focus within the monastery and within his teachings about healing our childhood wounds and the fact that actually the the wounds we get as children tend to actually stick with us all our lives. And actually one of the most important parts of our healing journey is to actually be able to go back and understand what it is that created these wounds and to start healing them. Brother Fapu, do you want to talk a little bit about um, about Tignatan and, and his focus on, on our childhood traumas? Yes, in Buddhism, we always uh, practice in order to have liberation. But liberation always has to be liberation of something. And a lot of the time as an adult, we we want to understand our suffering. And in Buddhism, we have to, we have to shine light into the reality of what is happening in the here and the now. And in meditation and in mindfulness, when you are aware of yourself, you can start to recognize what is causing you pain and what is causing you suffering. And therefore in Buddhism, the Buddha teaches us about the four noble truth. And the first noble truth is that there is suffering. And I used to ask like, why, why would suffering be so noble? And we, we learned that because suffering is present, therefore happiness is also there. It is the, the two opposite that goes hand in hand. And if there is happiness, then we know that suffering is also present. And we have to understand that you cannot look at suffering as as something that is only negative, because if you truly look deeply into suffering, you start to understand yourself more. You, you start to see why am I suffering? What are the roots of my suffering? Which is the second noble truth. We have to look deeply enough to see what are the causes of my suffering that is present today. And when you meditate on our suffering, we can recognize that our suffering is a continuation of the past. And a lot of us have the experience of yeah, early suffering as a child. And if we don't have the chance as a child to to transform it or to have a breakthrough and be free from it, then that suffering will still be very present with us today. And it is a kind of character that is developed and we carry it as, as we continue to grow. If we um, continue the way we are without understanding our suffering and taking care of it at at one point it's going to knock on our front door and say hey 
please take care of me. I am a child. I am you. I have not had the chance to be understood. You haven't yet taken care of me and transformed me. And I think each and every one of us have this kind of journey and has this kind of childhood wound that is present, either very small or very big. And everyone has a different story, and it's very unique. And in Buddhism and in our teachings, that when we understand our suffering, then at the same time we are understanding ourselves much more, and we have a chance to heal ourselves and begin anew with ourselves. And I think this is why it's so important in meditation is to have time and and have time for oneself. That's why our podcast is learning to come inward to see the way out. Talk about masks. So you know, my first sort of deep experience of transformation was um, I, I grew up talking, you, thinking I grew up in a perfect family, and that was my actually defense mechanism. And I remember I was a, a journalist for the Daily Telegraph. I was actually the Wall Street correspondent in New York, and I and I went off to report on um, a weekend workshop in New Orleans by um, uh, a very well-known sort of uh, therapist called John Bradshaw, who who became an expert on um, healing the child within. And I always remember that um, I was sitting in a group of about 300 people, and he just asked us to close our eyes and took us on a sort of visualization and he asked us to uh, to come back to, as an adult, to travel back in time mm-hmm. to when we were a child. And to he asked us to walk back to our family home. And I remember going in there and he said, go and find yourself as a child. And I remember going upstairs and going into my bedroom and seeing myself as probably, I think, an eight or nine year old. Um, just crying my eyes out and just feeling very, very alone. And um, and I really got in touch with the depths of the suffering and it realized that, you know, as an adult, we contextualize things, we understand things, we can go back and, under- oh, say this happened because of that. But actually to get back in touch with that original feeling that, that a child feels, which is absolute, and feeling this desperate sadness. And then he asked us to just I remember sitting on on the bed with myself as a child and realizing that I could go back in time as an adult and actually be present for myself as a child and that actually I could the two of us were there but but I could be there for myself in a way that I never could understand and then it ended um, with him suggesting that we sort of take our child by the hand and and walk out the house and um you know even as i say this now it sort of it it loses so much of the depth of feeling and transformation and i recognize at that moment first of all how much i'd hidden and blocked of my experience as a child and secondly that actually i had all the knowledge now and all the wisdom and all the understanding to be able to go and sit with myself as a child and start that healing process. And um, and that was a transformational experience. And I've realized that was 30 years ago now. Mm. And that I'm still, still on that healing journey. You know, I'm still, that healing journey is never finished, but the understanding and the ability to give myself love, give myself understanding, give myself compassion, was actually completely transformational. Sister Sinyam, tell us a little bit about, um, about you know, how this process has worked for you. Mm. Yeah, I definitely think that this is such an important practice um, for our personal growth, um, whether you seriously or kind of uh, intentionally embark on a spiritual journey or not. But I think it it has made me feel so much more whole as a person to have been through this this journey of healing for myself. Um, I remember when because we I, I was born just after the Vietnam War, nineteen seventy six, and then things were quite difficult after that. And my parents wanted to give me a future that is brighter than what they saw in the current state of Vietnam at the at the time. 
And so we were, we escaped on a boat. We were the boat people. Um, and um, we came, we were on the boat, on the ocean for five days and four nights. And I was very well protected by my parents because they're always there for me. But um, but it was in the refugee camps in Indonesia that when that was when I had the wound, and and I, and I didn't really know how to take care of it until I after I had become a monastic and known about the uh, the process of healing the inner child within. But um, during my stay in the uh, refugee camps, um, I was molested by a couple of teenage boys. And um, I remember that that evening my parents had to go to some sort of meeting with the community and they just left me with another girl of the same age as me just to kind of hang out. And then in uh, in the army barracks there was um, this older teenage boy who saw us and they said, oh, do you want to play a game? And of course, yeah, yeah, we want to play a game. We were kids, you know. <laughs> And um, so he just asked questions like, um, he said, if I ask you a question and you can't answer it, I will tickle you. And then, uh, of course, he, he asked, you know, really questions like, oh, where, where is Paris? Or I remember something about Paris. <laughs> um, and, of course, I, we had no idea. So he would tickle me and, and then um, take advantage of that moment. Um, and I remember that evening I was really angry uh, with my parents because they were not there to protect me. And I remember um, kind of emotionally cutting myself off from my parents by, you know, that night, because uh, I normally sleep with my mum next to my mum. And that night I I would turn away from her. I didn't want to uh, sleep and, and be cuddled next to her. And, um, yeah, it made it um, kind of... Um, gave me a very independent character. Um, of course, physically, I had to still be dependent on my parents for my schooling, for my daily needs. But emotionally, I would never go to my parents. I would never confide in my parents for anything. And when I got older, I was quite a wild child. I would do things and then tell them, for example, you know, um, I would uh, go to. Um, buy a ticket to uh, to go to see my boyfriend overseas and then tell them <laughs> afterwards. And this is something like total no-no in the Vietnamese community. It might not be anything in the in a Western um, country like Australia, but yeah, it made my parents suffer so much. And I just, I couldn't connect with their suffering at all. I just, I had no idea. I couldn't feel their suffering because I had been so emotionally cut off from them. And I was very angry with them, and um, and I I never told them about these incidents in the refugee camps until, like you know, five years ago or something, when I really began to um, share with them, and um, the first time, and they were very upset because all this time they they wanted to care for me, they wanted to take you know, protect me, but. But they couldn't, you know. I, they felt really helpless. And but I, I said to them, "It's okay. I'm I'm going through. I'm healing things now, and um, it's okay now. I mean, they're they're okay about it." Can you tell us a bit about your healing journey and how this practice has helped you? Mm. Um. I mean, aside from. Uh, being very angry with my parents and cutting off from my parents, I saw another effect was uh, the way that I relate to men, the way that I relate to sexual relationships, the way I relate to intimate intimacy. And I see that it has been uh, very... Uh, it comes from a wrong view. Uh, my the way that I relate to men has been coming from a wrong view, that all they want is sex and uh, I, I could see throughout my different partners that whenever I got into a relationship I always wanted to tell them about this wound inside of me and hoping that they could kind of hold it or help me to heal in some ways but of course they they didn't know how to and I never got that 
feeling of healing when I was in this relationship. And perhaps I was looking for some way to heal through being in this in, in an intimate relationship, but I didn't know how to, and I didn't know how to relate to them. I was either kind of always trying to please them or, or using um, sex as a way to manipulate. Um, and it was very unhealthy for me. And I suppose also growing up in a society where sex sells and you get everything bombarded with sexual images, sexual connotation, and uh, the society where sexual freedom is so much what people want, especially young people, and and it's all about individual pleasure. And you you know you everything was billboards, great big billboards, bigger, longer, that kind of thing. <laughs> and of course, I I feel I don't know. It was such a I feel that I w- I had gone in the wrong way for a long time. And I thought I had sexual freedom, but actually it didn't give me any happiness inside and it didn't really feel this kind of emptiness and this longing to heal inside until finally, uh, it's kind of like a ironic that I was looking for love and looking for healing through relationships, sexual relationships, but I couldn't find it until I got out of it I until I be I, I became celibate then I really had a chance to see myself more clearly see the wounds understand the wounds more clearly so that I can begin to heal my journey of healing myself and to heal the relationship with my parents that's also was very important and also to heal my relationship with men to begin to see men as spiritual beings and that there is a possibility for spirituality. Are there any particular practices that helped you? Because obviously Thich Nhat Hanh is known as the father of mindfulness, that you know, mm. he teaches about meditation, about walking meditation, about coming back to ourselves, about being in the present moment, uh, about healing. Uh, what, what within the, the spiritual practice of Thich Nhat Hanh has supported your healing process? I think... Reconnecting with my body was really important. Um, I mean, Tay talks about breathing and the breath as, as like a bridge and helping us to come back to our body, to be aware of our body and to listen to our body and learn how to take care of our body. Because um, I remember growing up and I always feel such a huge complex about my body. I hated my body. And because there was so much uh, in in the in the media about how you should look like as a young woman to be attractive, to be socially acceptable, and uh, I w- I remember feeling and thinking many times I should have some sort of cosmetic surgery or to enhance my physical appearance so that I could, because I thought that would bring me more happiness. And but it, it didn't. Luckily, I didn't have anything. <laughs> and it took m- many years to to be able to come back and learn to connect with my body, to listen to my body through all the daily practices of uh, being stopping and coming back to the breath, and learning to relax, learning to be aware of your body. Um, the sixteen um, exercises. exercises of breathing, um, to listen to your body, to calm your body to relax and release all the tension. And I also started to do Qigong, um, Tai Chi. And these also, I mean, Tai Chi and Qigong for me are not just about the movement, but it's about learning to be mindful in my movements because we often have sitting meditation and I also really love walking meditation. Walking meditation really helps me to come back to my body, to be aware of where there is tension and um, throughout the, the years of just practicing with the community, I, I, learned, to, I learned that actually the wounds, um, we may forget about the event itself, the, the situation, the story, but the body remembers the wound. The body remembers uh, the, the events that happen. And um, so just to learn to listen, to be able to... Um, release the tension. I remember a practice I did uh, while um, 
I was in Hong Kong is to play with my inner child, have a time to to play because I think maybe my uh, play is has been kind of um uh, what's the word tainted or it's been play is not pleasant play is kind of associated with something not very nice so I didn't know how to play and be natural and one day I was thinking I realized and observed that usually in the afternoon I would get very lonely this sense of being very lonely would come up and I would wonder why that is and one day I thought oh maybe it's my inner child and maybe let's just you know go for a, a bike ride with my inner child And I remember feeling very excited and I could I kind of visualize her sitting behind on the, the seat behind the bicycle and I would just ride the bicycle like very fast and feel the wind and and just play. I don't know, it's hard to kind of explain to you now, but it takes some sort of uh, experimenting to be with my little girl inside and to spend time playing with her because playing was is quite important to to spend time playing with her and being joyful with her was what um, helped so that she doesn't have to feel so lonely and and because I didn't know how to look after her and spend time with her, then just listening to her. And then later on, I also did some other things, like I did some drawings um, after telling my parents about it and and I drew a, a, a little fo a picture of my mum lying down and I draw the picture of the little girl turning in to my mum this time. And just one day, it, it just felt, I just felt, I wanted to draw this image of me turning back to my mum, turning back to, to be with her, to not have that separation and emotional cut off from her anymore. And so that was quite healing for me to be able to draw that and, and kind of express that process of coming back to my mum. Uh, Sister Sinim, I just want to say this is my first time hearing this story from you, and I'm very touched. And I'm, yeah, I'm here for you. <laughs> I'm your brother on the spiritual path, and I want to support you in any way that's possible. Um, I think we all have uh, a child within that is um, wounded, and we can say like that's the past that still needs to be reflected on, and even though our practice is to learn to dwell in the present moment and not be carried away by the future and be um, swept away by the past. But in meditation itself, we have to also visit the three times. And the three times, it means we have to know how to reflect in the past because in the past, how miserable it can be, it can be a lesson. It can be insight that uh, can allow us to stop because we recognize that what has happened to us gave us so much suffering. And if we don't transform this, we can be the person that will offer the same suffering to the next person that is close to us. And I think this was also part of my, um, my inner journey in the spiritual path because um, my family was also a refugee um, uh, moving uh, and coming to Canada and I, I, I didn't have to um, be on the boat with my parents. But when I arrived in Canada, my father um, had had also a really tough time in um, refugee camp. And of course, if you can't handle those suffering, then you find a way to express it. And it is through frustration, anger, alcohol, etc. And as a child, you're you're so pure, you just suck all of that in and that becomes you and i had a particular cousin who was who was very angry and i was one of his victim who he would just bully for no reason um and then when i be when i enter into the monastic community one of my realization is that i still have a lot of fear towards uh, a particular uh figure like a man who is um six foot tall a little bit 
um, sturdy. And whenever I see that, I can feel like I shrink a little bit, and and I have some complexes, inferiority complexes that arises. And I would say, like, I, I don't know, Sister Sinyu, how long it was for you to finally call it by its true name, but for myself, I think it was by like fourth year in as a monastic, and I started to. Ask myself, like, why do I have this nervousness around particular members in my community? And Thai's teaching is, um, we all have a five-year-old child, like we've been speaking about, or we can say eight-year-olds, nine-year-old. But we, we Thai chose five years old, and we have a meditation on the five-year-old child. But don't be caught by the number. Um, everyone is a different uh, history, and and for myself, you have to. We turn back and listen to that five-year-old child, because it's like a wound that is telling you that it needs healing. And and for myself, um, when I recognize that, and I remember what Tai taught us is also, we have to communicate with the child and tell the child that now we have a chance to heal. We are a grown-up. We have the right to protect ourselves. We know how to speak out. We know how to also be stable, and that's why in meditation we also it is also so important to know how to nourish our well-being. And the meditation is how to take care of our happiness, how to cultivate our joy, how to cultivate our compassion, how to cultivate our understanding. Because when you actually come back to that five-year-old child, that five-year-old child needs all of this. It needs compassion. It needs tenderness. It needs embracing, and it needs to be known that it's okay now. And I also remember um, just telling the five-year-old that. Everyone around you now, especially in Plum Village, these are very kind people. They are not there to harm you. They're there to just be with you on this path. And that was really like right now that I'm saying it. It sounds so simple, but for that moment when I was meditating with this uh, wounded child inside of me, it was a breakthrough. And I just had. I just remember. Feeling so much lighter, so much more free, but it wasn't the end, though. You know, and because we have habits and we have um, still marks of fear that needs to slowly be transformed. And even though I realized that, and I would go and go about my day with my community, see the brothers, the sisters, and then from time to time, I still recognize um, a reaction in my body. And then I tell that's when I say, "Oh, this is this is my five year old child that is still afraid," and you have to come back and you have to revisit the child and say, "It's okay, embrace it, be there for it." And it took me a, a few years to really can, where I can kind of say, "Like I am, I I have transformed you," and I think that child is still present, but it is so much more stronger. It is so much more wiser. Because the me today is that child also, and there's an even deeper practice within this is we also bring that meditation towards someone else that makes us suffer, because we can if we see that them as a five year old child must have had so much more suffering for them to behave in such a way, then we can have a little bit more understanding and we can even dare to have compassion for them. Yes. Brother Fapu, that's really interesting what you were saying about not only having compassion for ourselves, but also starting to have compassion for the people we think are responsible for our mm. suffering. So, so one of the things for me is that um, you know my parents did everything they could for me, and and you know I I have no particular trauma that I remember at all, um, and I think it's dangerous to sort of compare. My experience to other people's experience, because actually our our experiences, our own, is, is felt our own on our own. It's not for saying, "Oh, yours was worse than mine." We we feel what we feel, but I know that um, over the years, it's been very important for me to understand the context of my parents' life. As you were talking, not only 
as them as children, which I don't know. But, you know, my parents were also refugees, which is quite interesting that all of our parents were refugees. <laughs> and my father from Bulgaria, my mother from Germany. And actually, they had a lot of trauma and a lot of suffering themselves in their life, in their adult lives, having to leave their countries, having to start new lives, and, and you know, all, all the issues around that. And that was really helpful in sort of coming to terms and realizing actually they were doing their best. But I wonder, Sister Sinyam, you know, the perpetrators of the abuse of you, you know, has your feelings towards them changed? Has that, has the practice helped you to come to terms with that? What, what, what has that experience been like for you? Um, that's interesting because I haven't, I haven't done much with uh, the perpetrator um, in, in, perhaps I've tried to contemplate what their background is. Because when I was, because uh, I, I worked in mental health for some years, I was a psychologist, and um, working in the mental health field, I I understood that many people who suffer from mental illness have a history of sexual abuse. Maybe fifty up to fifty percent of people who have mental illness have some sort of sexual abuse uh, background, and even the perpetrators of sexual abuse were themselves victim of uh, some sort of abuse themselves. So for the people who, who, who molested me back then, the, the boys, I, um, yeah, I, I sometimes thought about, oh, what, what they must have experienced for them to be doing this to me. Um, the only thing that came up for me was that perhaps they had been um, touched inappropriately or if they had been abused themselves and they were kind of continuing that uh, in some ways. Or it could be that they were just kind of experimenting. They, As teenagers, your hormones go a bit haywire, <laughs> go a bit wild. And so maybe they were just out of curiosity or something like that, um, that they did this or they they may have seen somebody do it um, because the situation, the living conditions in the refugee camps are very basic and people just lived in, in each other's lives without much um, privacy. And um, I, I don't have any um, ill feelings towards these um, teenage boys. Um, yeah, it was more an internal process for me where I had to deal with a lot of anger towards my parents and cutting them off and and realizing that oh, I had actually cut them off from my life. And I didn't realize it back then because, um, yeah, as a child, you just kind of uh, did things without thinking about it. You just It was just a natural reaction to, no, I don't want to um, connect with my parents anymore because... I, I didn't think they were reliable or something like that. And, of course, like you said, they had done the best they could uh, given the conditions and things like that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really blame them, but I just remember being very angry with them and cutting them off and not, not wanting to involve them in my personal life so much, that's all. And, and brother, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, this bullying. Mm. You know, how, how do you feel towards the person that perpetrated that? Yeah, I've I've always had fear around him. I remember growing up and even later on after I became a monk, even on my home visit, um, I, I still had a percentage of, of fear, more fear than anger, interestingly. But at one point, I started to see, I started to forgive him for me meaning that I wanted to move on from this and I really wanted to heal this five-year-old in me. And maybe in this lifetime, he won't change because he doesn't have enough conditions to join um, or to be introduced into a spiritual community or into a way of life to recognize and to transform. And if I'm to wait for him to heal for me to be satisfied, that might never happen. And so I, I started to accept that action and then forgive my, myself for being weak at that moment. And I think I forgave him inside of me for my own sake, for my own 
um, growth. And I, I think through that process, I, I don't want to sound so arrogant, but um, I've always recognized that I forgive a lot of people. And I think this, this comes from my mother. My mother is someone who's very kind and who's very understanding in, in her own way. And I'm very grateful that somehow this has been transmitted to me and it's through her way of taking care of me as a child. And I, I've, now that he has children, which are like my nephews and nieces, I think if I, were, if I didn't become a monk and I have not met the practice, I may have behaved in a particular way to, to give back violence, to give back um, an action to, to, to feel at ease with what has happened to me in the past towards my, my particular cousin. And thanks to this, because I have been able to um, understood and forgive him inside of me, I've been able to stop that cycle of hate. And, and every time I see, um, I see uh, my nephew and nieces that are his children, I only have love for them. And, and um, I really want them to have a, a much better experience as a child that is with love. Because I have learned through Thai's teaching is that as an adult or as a parent, as an elder brother, as an elder sister, an uncle, an aunt, or a friend, just our way of being is a teaching the way we interact is a transmission in its own right, in its own way. So this has, this suffering has given me a lot of awareness in how I behave. And, and that has an uh, impact right away. And this is a very tender space, isn't mm. it? Because it's not about excusing people's behavior. Mm. Uh, but, but uh, you know, what, as you were talking, it triggers this memory. Of, I, I remember reading an article about, um, a man who had killed a woman and the parents whose daughter had been murdered saying that they forgave the killer. And and I always remember being so shocked because when I was reading it, someone asked them, you know, why have you forgiven them? And and they said, because otherwise our whole lives would be ruined and soured by that experience. Mm. And actually, if we don't let go, then actually the perpetrator continues to make us suffer. Actually, we never break that cycle. Right. But one of the one of the things, as we're talking, I know it's been important for me is is that in a sense, as children, we lose our innocence, mm. and um, and I sometimes feel our journey through life is about regaining our innocence. And and I remember once, um, and I found creative visualizations to be very powerful. And I was once seeing a therapist, and and he took me through this creative visual, visualization, this journey. And I remember leaping uh, into the abyss. Actually, I, well, I didn't leap. I was actually hanging on to the, to the edge of, of uh, the abyss for all my life. And he said, just let go. And I remember falling, 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 and eventually landing softly on my feet in a very dark space, but, but seeing a passageway as my eyes acclimatized to the light, uh, the, the very minimal light that was there. And I remember following... Um, this path through this sort of tunnel and coming across uh, a very still pool of water. And there was a candle burning on the other side and a little bassinet with a child in. And I walked over to the bassinet and picked up the child and realized that the child was myself, mm. was my innocent self. And I remember hugging that child. And as I hugged the child, I remember the darkness disappearing and in a sense me being catapulted back up to the surface of the earth and it was a beautiful spring day and all the birds were singing and it was a very sort of bucolic image of rolling hills and green grass and butterflies but but what i realized is i had regained my innocence and i i, I think in a sense we're all on that path we're all hurt we all suffer and um and Thich Han talks very much about this original suffering from even our birth. I mean, it's not that we have to have had a traumatic experience as we're growing up. Actually, our birth is a traumatic experience. I mean, Brother Pepe, do you want to talk a little bit about, about just helping us understand that? Oh, sure. Um, just, just to bring context to this sharing is, um, so in our, 
in our retreats that we offer, especially during the summer, I think we are one of the rare monasteries that allow children to come and meditate with adults. And of course, they don't sit for 30 minutes in silence. They don't do slow walking meditation. They don't eat in full silence. But we actually create programs that um, can let the children experience wellness, well-being, and just being around a community that is loving And I think that is very important. And in our teachers' Dharma talks, as well as now our Dharma talks, as Dharma teachers start to teach uh, on behalf of our teacher, we always save the the beginning about 10 to 15 minutes to, to, to share the Dharma for the young ones. And we would use stories, we would use, um, examples to let them understand about good action or so and so. And in one particular time, um, in one of Thai's stories, Thai is Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh. It means teacher in Vietnamese. Um, Thai's story that, that he shares that always interests me and it gives me a lot of um, reflection is Thai talks to us and asks us to meditate uh, when we were a child, a baby in the womb of our mother how comfortable it was, how much love our mother is giving us at that moment because we are connected to our mother uh, through the umbilical cord. Is that right? Mm, Yes, that's right. And whatever she is eating is feeding us. Whatever, how she's breathing, we are breathing through that. What she's drinking, we are being nourished. And her experience in that moment is what we are experiencing inside of her. And dear child, do you know that because your father is aware that you are inside your mother. Your father wants to do everything he can to comfort your mother, to offer peace and wellness. So suddenly you're being embraced by this love. And that moment when it comes that you want to come out and you want to be on your own, um, it's actually a very scary moment. I'm sure most of us, we don't remember but it's there in deep down inside of us. It's because it's, that, it's the first moment when we had to f- take our own first breath. We had to inhale, right? And we had to breathe on our own and we know now we are separate. And Tai sometimes says that is actually the first moment of fear, original fear. And that original fear is also connected to separate, being separated from our mother, the love and the tenderness and the care that she has given to us through that nine months. So that is just a meditation for us to reflect on and that we can already see that even though we we can have one of the happiest childhood, but there is fear that is there. There is some suffering that is there. And if we look at suffering with a new light, seeing it as a way for us to understand ourselves more, to understand the world more, to understand our loved ones more, then suffering becomes something as like a teacher, like a friend. And our teacher believes and t- teaches us like, if we know how to suffer, then we will suffer much less. Meaning if we know how to recognize our suffering, understand our suffering, take care of our suffering, give it a chance to transform, our suffering will not be just pain. It will also be healing in itself. And that is wellness. That is strength for oneself. And as you say, the the name of this podcast series, The Way Out is In, because we have to, I think a lot of people fear that if they go into their suffering, it will destroy them. It will, and it will be so large that they won't be able to cope with it. But the truth, I've always had this uh, sort of uh, imagery of this, of a sort of a mouse in front of a light in a room, dark room, and, and on the wall, it looks like there's this huge monster coming to get you and, and you want to run away. But actually, when you face that fear, it turns out to be, actually, we, we have the, the ability to face it because it turns out to be not as great as we have and that we have the capacity to find a way. And and sister, I, I, I wanted to ask you because, you know, so so much of the heart of Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching is about engaged Buddhism. You're not just healing for yourself, but through your healing, you 
you're you're healing for the collective consciousness. You're also healing that when someone comes to you, um, because the monastics do a lot of support to individuals and groups, that when other people come with their suffering, that you're able to be present for them. Can can you talk about that sort of process of your own healing as a route to um, a collective healing? Just before I talk about that, um, when Brother Fapu was talking about the, the experience of being the womb, and sometimes a, a birth could be very traumatic because something goes wrong at birth and that original fear could be very big, but actually you may not have like a, a memory of it, but there is a felt feeling of real fear. Um, so that's, I mean... That's just another point that I wanted to mention. Yeah, yeah. Can, the birth um, process can be a very uh, uh, life or death experience. It's a great suffering mm. in its own right, but we'll, as the brother Fapu says, we have very little memory of it, mm, if yeah, at all. Yeah, but but it's still kind of inside us. Uh, we we still store in our we we keep a memory of it in our store consciousness, not n- even if we're not conscious of it in our daily life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to the point what, um, about engaged Buddhism, about how my healing could help other people. Um, well, first of all, when, when, I, when I can heal for myself, then I feel more whole as a person. I, I'm able to take care of my loneliness when it comes up. And, and I feel that after that time when I began to observe that my loneliness comes up at a, at a regular time, then since then it hasn't come up. So it's like um, you've been able to take care of some aspect of that wound and it doesn't become a problem for you anymore. And your inner child kind of grows up and becomes stronger, as Brother Papu said. And um, you're not so controlled by that urge to um, to get into a relationship in order to heal because I know I have that seed inside of me of being uh, attachment of wanting to be in a relationship with somebody in order to heal. But since I've been able to heal, I don't rely on that um, having somebody external in order to make me feel well and whole. And through the process of being able to be aware of my body and take care of my body, I feel... Um, that I can be myself. I, can, I don't have to be somebody else. I don't have to worry about how my appearance is. But I still notice sometimes when these thoughts come up and I can just recognize, ah, that's just my habit and I don't have to worry about that anymore. But um, I suppose when I can share about my experience then, or I can help people or when people come to me and share with me their difficulties, then I can empathize with them more easily because I've been through it myself and uh, can offer some hope that there is a possibility of transformation and healing. And I know that when, when we practice in the community, um, that's, that's the one thing that really helped me to uh, be able to let go of my career so easily because I saw that when I practice for myself and create the healing energy, the peaceful energy, the wholeness energy for myself, then those who come and and in touch with the practice, they receive that energy. So as as um, I I was doing therapy in a very natural way. I was living my therapy. I, I don't have to. I remember being as a psychologist. I always struggle. How can I help this person through their really huge suffering? And sometimes I felt very helpless. Most of the time, I felt very helpless in in the face of huge suffering and abuse and I didn't know how to help them but when I came to the practice and I was practicing to heal myself and people came to practice to touch that peace to touch that relaxation to touch that inner healing for themselves they also started to heal without me having to try and do anything so that's why I thought oh great you know a great way to do therapy without doing anything and of course there is always this but as a therapist, you have to maintain some sort of professional boundary with your clients. And and I always felt so, it was so unnatural because you can't do some very simple things like just sit and offer your listening and sit and enjoy a cup of tea, walk together, eat together. These sometimes are very nourishing things, nourish our joy and happiness for the simple things in life mm. that really heals people. 
But in in the professional context, I couldn't do that. I could only go talk about the suffering again. And sometimes when people talk about their suffering, they're reliving their suffering and they're being re-traumatized in, in that way. And of course, there are methods and techniques to help people through their suffering. But I realize it's so important to be able to heal through these very simple things, like being able to reconnect with your body, to relax, release the tension in your body. You know, when you go to a therapist, you have one hour or maximum two, one hour and a half with them. And then after that, you have to deal with your daily life again. And you don't know how to nourish your joy. And you don't know how to touch peace in your daily life. But with the practice, you do that. And I think that is so important for the healing process to be able to nourish that joy, to be able to nourish that peace and solidity. And I think that's what really helped me to be able to open up the more difficult things Uh, in in my wound and and that's what i love most about engaged uh, buddhism and when you come here for the practice you really learn to bring the practice in your daily life so that you become more solid more stable more peaceful in order to be able to embrace the really difficult stuff because you need that if you don't have a solid foundation of peace and connectedness and groundedness when your suffering comes up you are automatically carried away. You are overwhelmed by the past and you are not able to be grounded in your in the present moment with your breath. And that is such a really, really important daily practice that enables you to heal deeper wounds. That's so interesting, sister, because um, I'm beautifully spoken, if you don't mind me saying so. I can feel your power in your voice. And... Um, you know, so so much about healing is about time and space, mm-hmm. and and I, 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 you know, you talked about often people uh, think about sort of sex as a way of escaping suffering, but actually, the whole of modern Western capitalist system is based on the avoidance of suffering. It's like mm. it's like we've created tried to create a bypass for suffering that we have so many things we can fill our time in, and actually, rather than touch our suffering, people use any excuse. To avoid the suffering, as though as though anything like whether it's alcohol, gambling, sex, um, any of those, none of those can help because no. they don't take us to the place we need to go. Mm. It's only if we go into it that we can find. But as it, but what you're so beautifully speaking of is is we need to create a, a foundation from which we can respond and accept because otherwise we'll continue to be knocked over and unable to find our path right and we'll just continue to run away from ourselves. and um i i just want to um add a little bit to what our dear sisters share and and a community is so important i know my transformation i i can only give gratitude and thankfulness to my community for for being there and supporting and even though um they know I suffered. They, I just have to see that they are there and they are stable, solid, that I can come and just have a cup of tea and know it's okay because that's my inner healing that I'm still doing to overcome my own complexes. And by their presence there, they, they can give me their stability. And I, I see that um, our teacher emphasizes a lot on brotherhood and sisterhood, friendship. And this is one of his message to all of us is that we need communities. As an individual, yes, we can recognize our own suffering, but sometimes our own dark corners is too big for us to to shine the light. We need other friends to help us see the blind spot so that we can um, step out of our suffering or recognize it and transform it. And I think this is um, something that we are still aspiring to do. That's why I think we're still here in Plum Village and we're still um, devoting our life to building this community and offering these teachings uh, throughout our years so that we can help many of us connect to ourselves, connect to our body, like what our sisters share, to accept their body, don't be ashamed of it. Um, and and yeah. knowing that in this very moment, this present moment is creating the past Mm. this is what this is one of the key that helped me become more free which is this present moment if we live it deeply it will become the new past and instead of remembering of 
of the difficulties in the past, we know how to build a new past so that can mm. help heal the other past. And in this way, we're also building our future. It's very simple, but it's very deep, and is uh, it? It's really a a commitment. You have mm. to you have to have courage also to. Um, to transform oneself, and just uh, before we end, I, I just wanted to complete my story, and and very inspired by our sister's um, transformation, and and one of my engagement in in my action of um, healing the past was also I started to recognize as I was growing up, especially around twelve and eleven, I I was also I had a violent side in me, and and a particular one particular younger cousin I had. I remember also bullying her, and even though I know I truly deeply loved her, because she was the only child, and she looked towards me and my elder sister as her own siblings, and we played together every day. But from time to time, I would remember, you know, saying something really mean for no reason, or doing something just to make her angry for no reason. And throughout throughout my my transformation of recognizing my five year old child and healing it, I started to recognize to that experience. And at one moment, I called my cousin, and and I've been a monk already now like four or five years, and I called her, and I apologize. I said, "Hey cousin, I'm calling you because I really want to say sorry." And we haven't seen each other for four or five years because I became a monk living in France now. And she said, "We haven't seen each other for so long. Why are you apologizing for?" And I said, "Well, do you do you remember all those time?" And she said, "Oh yeah, you were so mean to me for no reason." <laughs> and I said, "Exactly. I I really want to apologize and please, with understanding, accept if you can." And she said, "Oh, I've forgiven you a long time already, but that wasn't important for me. What was important is that I, I spoke up and I acknowledged my action and I acknowledged something that I was not proud of, because I felt if I didn't have that courage to, to say that, to share that, then that that wound she she could have experienced." She, and she could have still held on to it, and I I truly believe that with that um, action I was able to stop that um, and let that heal, and so that she doesn't continue this into the future. And so we can see that with meditation it gives us insight, but we also have to have courage to to do what is right. And also. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about the fact is we don't have to wait years. We could mm. we can say something in in the moment where our anger or frustration comes up. We can say something in the moment in that moment that is mean or upsetting to somebody. But we can. I mean, I think Tai says you know it's like firing an arrow. We can send a second arrow after that first arrow to neutralize the first one. So so actually we can do that at any point. And in fact, my wife Paz says sometimes if you can't heal it with the person you have the problem with, you can be generous to somebody else, mm. and you can do the healing in a in a in a in a in another way. So so there's always ways to to find space for healing. Exactly, Sister Sinyim, it's been such a pleasure um, you joining us today, and for being so honest. Because uh, because one another thing that this honesty does is it, it gives permission to other people. So you've given permission to the, both of us to share more freely because of your willingness and vulnerability to share. So so that uh, is such a wonderful example of of the power of vulnerability, that by being vulnerable, often people see it as a weakness, but actually almost it's the greatest strength and it gives permission. So thank you for joining us and, and we wish you all speed to um, to Australia and to bring your wisdom and teaching to people there. They, they are very, very lucky to be receiving you. Thank you very much for having me and for giving me this opportunity to share about my story because, um, yeah, I, I've kind of held on to this story for 30, more than 30 years and didn't know how to handle it and didn't know how to heal. But, um, yeah, I, I realized that slowly I can talk about it more freely. Before I couldn't, I couldn't speak about it in a public 
space like this. I could hardly tell anyone. I couldn't talk to my parents. And but um, as I'm as I'm learning to heal myself, and it's still an ongoing process. I learned that I can uh, begin to love truly, touch true love. Before I, I got very mixed up between love and sex, and um, it's through this healing process that I start to touch uh, true love. And and kind of, like I said, ironically, you know, when I start to leave the the um, the inter the sexual relationship uh, context, to have a celibate life, that I begin to really. Find healing for myself in this in this way in terms of relationship with men and relationship with myself. I can really feel more love for myself and feel connected to my body and feel more whole and accept my body for it is. And I can also relate to my brother in a much more healthy way. And I I really feel very grateful that I can see the the spirituality in my brothers and not relate to them as just <laughs> what I thought before. <laughs> All they want is sex, but like I can really begin to heal my relationship with men and really begin to have a true relationship with my brothers. Mm. So we wish mm. all our listeners, all of you, um, a healing journey, a chance to um, come back to ourselves to heal. And um, on every podcast, uh, we seek to end with a short meditation. So, yes. Brother Fapu, can you uh, give us a short meditation, please? So, dear listeners, wherever you are, even if you are walking, going for a jog, you're on a commute, sitting on a train, a bus, or you are cleaning your house or doing homework, um, if you allow yourself to just be still for a few minutes and allow me to guide you in a little meditation I think what is appropriate after this podcast is to generate love for oneself. So let us uh, reconnect to the breath. Just become aware of our body. If we're standing, sitting, if there's any tension in our shoulders, in our back, in our face, just release the tension and become aware of the in-breath. As I breathe in, I know this is an in-breath. As I breathe out, I know this is an out-breath. Just identify this is in-breath and this is out-breath. And now let us concentrate with the in-breath. As I breathe in, I follow my in-breath from the beginning to the end. And as I breathe out, I concentrate on my out-breath, following the out-breath from the beginning to the end. Let the breath bring the mind home to the body. In this very minute, very moment, allow yourself to connect to the sensations in your body. Breathing in, I am aware of my body. I accept my body. And breathing out, I smile to my body. Our body has worked very hard throughout the years. It needs our gentleness, our tenderness, our awareness. Now offer it the care and the love that is deep in our hearts. Aware of my body, I offer love to my body. Breathing in, my past is also very present. I bring my understanding and my compassion in this very moment to shine light to my past. Breathing in, the past is in the now. Breathing out, I will transform the past. I will heal the past. 
I will take care of the past in the very here and now. Breathing in, I have compassion for myself. Breathing out, I accept myself. Now with this love, this compassion inside of us, I offer it to my loved ones around me. Breathing in, I can think of a person that is very dear to me, that needs my love, needs my compassion. I hold them in my heart. And breathing out, I send my loving kindness, my compassion, my joy, my and my inclusiveness to that person. In love inside of me, out, I offer this love to the ones that are dear to me. Breathing in, this is the present moment. Breathing out, this is a wonderful moment. Thank you, dear listeners, for practicing with us here in Plum Village, France. Yes, and if you enjoyed uh, this podcast, then you can listen to the rest of the series, The Way Out is In, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, all other platforms that carry podcasts. And a special mention, as always, to our very own Plum Village app. And this podcast was brought to you by the Plum Village community, as well as the Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation. Oh. Uh-huh.